its teachings that have to do with purgatory. Could you give us a page reference just so we're all... Yeah, we're, uh, in the handout, we're going to be on page 26, the big handout. Um, and then after that, we'll talk about paradise, and then I will end by doing a little bit on um, indulgences, just a very brief understanding of what they are. So we've been looking at the, at the uh, scriptural passages, and we need to be very clear right now. I'll mention it probably a few times. Um, the word of God, as far as what is Catholic doctrine, is only those three paragraphs we looked at in the catechism, which are, in your hand, which are fully uh, quoted in the handout, and these scriptural passages. Anything else falls under the understanding of theology. Now, in the case of purgatory, a lot of this theology has been pretty much unchanged for hundreds of years, which gives it a, a, a gravity and importance. But it is still, we need to recall that the uh, theology is not doctrine. The church has not ruled definitively on any of these things. But theologians, using what is found in scripture, using the teachings of the church and the councils, and then also using those vision, those private revelations, the visions of certain saints who have seen purgatory, Catherine of Genoa, uh, Padre Pio, in more recent times we have uh, St. Faustina uh, and others, and then as well as those people who have experienced a, a encounter with a purgatorial spirit, a spirit that has returned from purgatory, usually to ask for prayers. From what they've told us, from what they've seen, we can also kind of fit that in because it fit, does fit very well for the most part with what scripture tells us, the images and the teachings. But it is important to realize that the actual doctrinal teachings of the church are very little. In fact, on the small handout I just gave you today, it's basically page one is it. Everything else is going to be theology. What the church proposes to be, probably be true, but it can't guarantee it at the level of, of divine faith. So we've been looking at the scripture passages, and we looked at uh, the Old Testament, really just focusing on one major one, about prayers for the dead, that you could offer sacrifice for them, that their sins could be cleansed after death. Then we kind of entered into Jesus, and we see a lot of his parables, more so than we realize, and I didn't, give you, I didn't even follow all of them. If you actually go back and you start to look at the parables more and more, you'll realize that most of them actually deal with either the kingdom of God, the time of purgatory, the things of death, and the afterlife, the kingdom that's coming after. And so we see that Jesus uh, kind of accepts wholeheartedly the Jewish understanding. He simply now adds more to it, more understanding, more evidence. So he's the one who tells us, yes, all the dead go to the one place, but it's actually divided even after death for the good souls and the bad. He tells us about the necessity of um, the debt we owe of sin to God and talks about paying the last penny, paying off the whole debt. Only things like charity and part and forgiveness can pardon kind of that, that hard heartedness. So Jesus has been kind of giving us more and more information. And the last passage of his we're going to look at today is a very short one, but it, it um, points again back to the Old Testament Maccabee story, but also puts it sort of forward in a new idea. It's a very short section. Um, the context of the quote occurs when Jesus has just performed a, an exorcism. And the Pharisees accuse him of being able to have this power because he himself is demon-possessed. And so in the context of that, Jesus says several things. First, he challenges his hearers with an either-or statement. He says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So he places this black and white challenge of how they're understanding Jesus' teachings. Then he, the exorcism is performed. He's accused of being a um, demon worshiper or demon possessed. And so he answers that charge. And then in, in his answer, the last few sentences are what we're going to look at. And so it's on page 26, almost the bottom of the the actual page, not the footnotes. He mentions this, and I know you've all at least heard it before in context. He says, therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. 
And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. So very traditional language here. That is very Jewish language. The phrase, the age to come and this age, those are Hebrew terms. The ha'olam abba, the age to come. We use it in the, in the Nicene Creed, right? I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Same word, aeon, is world or age. So very Jewish, it ties in. Also the idea that you can forgive sins in this world and in the next. So he makes this statement and he says, basically from Jesus' teaching, some sins, in fact, we would say all sins, can be forgiven here and now during our life on earth. But there are some sins, Jesus implies without being specific, that can be forgiven after death, connecting back to the Maccabees and his earlier parables. And then he says there are some sins that cannot be forgiven either on earth or in heaven. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, um, any sin can be forgiven if it is repented of during our life on earth. But after one has died and passed into the age to come, mortal sin can no longer be forgiven because that's literally who you are at the moment of death. If you're in the state of mortal sin, that determines who you are. So the sins that can, quote, be forgiven, and that's why he makes the statement, right? Um, sin against the Holy Spirit is a, quote, mortal sin that cannot be forgiven um, without repentance and, and the change of heart, which can only occur during life. So Jesus sets up the dichotomy as well that there are some sins in today's language as Catholics, we would call them venial. Venial sins can be forgiven now or after death. Mortal sins can only be forgiven now. So using the, the Jewish idea as well that's come to us as Catholics, there are those sins that are called with a high hand, which are, quote, mortal, which have to necessitate a special sacrifice. Um, Jesus makes everything easier in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, and still true for Jews today, if you commit a purposeful, if you commit a mortal sin, there is no forgiveness for you except one day of the year. Yom Kippur. You better pray you live to make it that year. Seriously, it's a stressful thing. That's the only time that that sin can be forgiven. Other sins can be forgiven in, in many other ways, but... So when Jesus comes and he sort of, he still uses Israel, but he perfects it. Now the priest anywhere can forgive mortal sins whenever. Normally it's done at a normal confession time, but you could, you know, make an appointment. You could do whatever. Any mortal sin is, is just as easy in the sense of seeking your pardon and peace as those lesser sins are. So, but Jesus does make the distinction that there are these sins that are very serious. And we've seen that in his parables. Remember he talked about those who, um, the servant who acts as his master wishes, he's going to be rewarded. The servant who gets drunk and beats everyone and is horrible, he's going to be punished, uh, actually sent to hell. And then you have that middle group of people who are more or less liable. They knew what they should have done. Some didn't out of laziness. Others were truly ignorant. And so there's some kind of, um, there's a difference, though, between the effects ultimately that our sins have. So Jesus, once again, reaffirms basically the understanding of uh, the Maccabees that some sins can be forgiven after death if they don't rise to a level of an unforgiven, very serious, um, what we would call mortal sin. Now, it's not directly about purgatory, but I just want to mention something. In the context of the story itself, where it arises from, and it's found in all four Gospels, um, it's found in the three synoptics in the same version, and then in John, I believe it's chapter 8 it's found in, and it's a slightly different uh, aversion, but he, Jesus basically says the same thing. And the unforgivable sin that Jesus is talking about specifically 
is to attribute the powers of God to Satan. Right? That's what's being claimed. Here you have Jesus. He is healing people. He is freeing them from demon possession. And the Pharisees, because of their own agenda and certainty of their own faith, can only see what he's doing as literally demonic. Right? They can't see beyond that. He has the same problem with him in the story of the man born blind, if you remember. And he heals him. And then it's this back and forth between the Pharisees and the man and everything else. And then finally at the end, Jesus addresses the Pharisees and he said, if you were blind, you could be forgiven. But you say, I see, so your sin remains. In other words, they, they can't even wrap their minds around the fact that he might be doing good. Um, now, that doesn't, that doesn't change the basic idea of what is the unforgivable sin. It's the sin that we will not repent of because we don't think we have to. Jesus just, in the actual story, he gives us an actual example of that. They are so hard-hearted, so certain in their own faith, they're never, never going to seek to repent from that because they're so sure they're right. And therefore, they're going to die in that state of, of um, uh, mortal sin. So what the church actually says in the catechism after it addresses this question and that story, it says, there are no limits to the mercy of God, but anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting rejects the forgiveness of his sins and the salvation offered by the Holy Spirit. Such hardness of heart can lead to final impenitence and eternal loss. So the basic understanding is Venial sins can still be cleansed away because they only wound our relationship, whereas a mortal sin, in some sense, breaks the entire relationship with God, and so it absolutely necessitates a, a pardon, a forgiveness, a repentance here in this world while one is still alive before they can move forward. Now, except for that teaching, most of Jesus' teachings come couched in parables. And so it's important that when we read the scriptures and when the church makes doctrine, it looks at the genres that are written. Um, a problem sometimes we have is we, we, we open the Bible and no matter what we turn to, we read it in exactly the same way. And that's just because of sort of an ignorance of that time, that culture on our part, and maybe some wrong ideas about what the Bible is. But the Bible has genres that have to be read differently. Uh, we know this ourselves, just as you grow up in a culture and a place, a society, you just learn your society's genres. You don't necessarily have to be taught it directly, right? We know that you're supposed to read an opinion section different than you would read the news section, different than you would read the personal ads. But somehow when we get to the Bible, we read it all exactly the same. And when we're dealing with parables, we have to realize that Jesus is making a point. He is giving us principles but we have to be a little careful about applying a literal word for word or idea for idea meaning of what is going to actually happen, say, in purgatory to what Jesus says. With Paul, however, who we're now turning to, Paul doesn't write in parables. <laughs> Paul is writing straightforward. Um, and so when, in Paul's letters, we have sort of a different idea. Two of them are very short statements that he makes, but they show us again that Paul is a good first century Jew. He follows the Jewish idea of prayers for the dead. He incorporates Jesus' teaching, we can tell in some of the things he says. And then finally in the last one, which we'll end with our scripture part, um, Paul gives us the most vivid, clear description of what the process of purgatory is like. So turning to him, where we can look a little more straightforwardly, on page 28, near the bottom, the indented paragraph, Paul has a small statement. Now, this comes right from the beginning of his greeting in the first letter to Timothy, or excuse me, second letter to Timothy. So it's easy to miss, right? In the beginning of his letters, Paul, a lot of times, will point out this person, this, and <laughs> greet them. And so in the midst of that, Paul says this. May the Lord grant mercy to the family of Onesiphorus because he often gave me a new heart and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he came to Rome, he promptly searched for me and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. 
and you know very well the services he rendered in Ephesus. And then Paul just goes on. Very easy to miss. But something is very clear. Onesiphorus is dead. There's the, even Protestants who don't believe in purgatory admit that. Right? It's clear from the story. It's even more clear in the Greek. That's why he's asking for mercy for his family, right? So they have consolation and peace over the death of their loved one. And he has clearly passed away as well. Everything about him is past tense. And he's referred to again in the past tense in the very last chapter of 2 Timothy. Now, although we don't know tons about Onesiphorus, we can say certain things. Paul clearly thinks he died as a very holy Christian. I mean, that's, it's pretty clear, right? When everyone else, Paul says, abandoned him, uh, Onesiphorus was there. He would encourage Paul. He gave him a new heart, he says. He was not ashamed of his chains, right? You'd put yourself to great risk to go visit people in prison by the state. And yet, Paul tells us, not only did he seek not ashamed of my chains, when he came to Rome, where Paul is imprisoned under house arrest with Roman guards by the emperor himself, he actually sought him out to help him. So, and then he refers to what we don't know exactly what he did, but he helped him in Ephesus. All the services he, he, he rendered him in Ephesus. So, clearly, most of us can agree, I think, that Onesiphorus is a good man who we would say died in the state of grace. Yet, still, Paul says, may the Lord grant him to find mercy on the day from the Lord. Notice it's weird too, the Lord and the Lord. That's because may the Lord Jesus be with him to find mercy before the face of the Father on that day. So Paul is praying for Onesiphorus and the only way this passage makes any sense is if we understand that Paul is not referring to Onesiphorus as being saved. He already assumes that. But he has to be referring to some kind of after death purification or mercy that occurs, right? Paul doesn't seem to be in any way worried about Onesiphorus's eventual salvation. He's more worried that he'll find mercy for what these other things are. Now, what are the other things? Well, what, another thing to kind of think about is this, uh, and this is where um, uh, Cardinal Cahayton and others, the man who debated Luther before the final uh, excommunication of Luther, he pointed out in this story that um, if, if Luther denied purgatory from a, pic, a statement like this, then Paul is simply writing nonsense. Because if Onesiphorus is saved, then why does, why does he ask to show him mercy? If nothing more was, for, was necessary for Onesiphorus to be saved, went, right? once saved, always saved, I just have faith alone, I go right to heaven. If that was all, then everything Paul just wrote is at best superfluous. Why did he even mention something to put it in people's minds who would then be wondering what he was talking about? Or insulting. Right? If he's holy, why are you saying, well, maybe not. Right? So... The whole passage is, is important that it's telling us, even a Christian like Onesiphorus, even someone in, in the state of grace, still may have some kind of sins, some kind of vestige, some hard-heartedness of their heart that isn't perfectly um, connected to God that needed to be atoned for. And Paul very uh, understands that he can pray and ask others to pray for Onesiphorus and that those prayers will actually do something for him and help him in that process in the afterlife. So Paul clearly, as Judaism before him and as Jesus, Paul clearly not only believes in prayer for the dead, he offers it here directly in a story. May the Lord offer, give him this consolation and peace on the day, right? On the day of judgment, on the day he's discovered um, when he, everything is brought to light. So Paul believes in prayer for the dead, and he tells people to engage in prayer for the dead. Now, the second passage, which is short from Paul, is weird, and it, but it's very similar. Again, looking at the context, um, 
in the context, Paul is talking about, and this one comes from um, 1 Corinthians, or, yeah, 1 Corinthians. In, in 1 Corinthians, Paul is, is engaging in a discussion about how does the resurrection going to occur. And prior to the statement we're going to look at, Paul has said, just as in Adam all died, all in Christ, all are brought to life, but in a proper order. And then he describes the order of how people come into salvation at the end of time, the very end. Now, right before the passage we're going to look at, if you turn one page to page 30 at the top, this is the immediate context. And actually, the last verse here, the, the, the period that ends here is where the next, the verse we're going to look at begins. But this gives us a little more idea of what he's talking about. He's describing the last days. He says, quote, then comes the end when he, Jesus, hands over the kingdom to his God and Father. When he, again Jesus, has destroyed every sovereignty and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all en his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he subjected everything under his feet. Now, in the context of telling us Christ's ultimate victory. Now turn back to page 29. This is the very next thing Paul says, which is not only is the statement already odd to begin with, but it's, a, it's an interesting way to end this whole discussion. Near the bottom of page 29, he says, when everything is subjected to him, Jesus, then the son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him so that God may be all in all. So Jesus completes his victory over the world, his second coming, but Jesus is not the father, and so Jesus even subjects himself then to the father in the end, and then everything is perfect, and God inheres in everything perfectly, and that's, quote, the end, the kingdom comes. Then Paul says this weird thing. Otherwise... So knowing that God will be victorious and everyone will be raised and all this stuff. Otherwise, what will people accomplish by having themselves baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are they having themselves baptized for them? Okay, a weird passage. Um, and we have to understand what, what Paul is talking about. The first thing that he's not talking about he is not talking about what Mormons do, baptism for the dead. If you don't know, that's why Mormons are so into genealogy, right? Until we started having all the tests you spit into and everything else. If you wanted your genealogical record, you usually went to Salt Lake City. Why is that? Because in their faith, Mormons, um, anyway, what they do is they will have two Mormons stand up and be baptized and they'll read a long list of names, male names for the man, female names for the women, your names. Probably we've all, I'm sure, been baptized in the Mormon church, whether we knew it or not. And it's an understanding to be baptized for these people so that in the next life, they're part of the whole Mormon idea of salvation, which I'm not even going to begin to try to explain. It's weird. But um, that's not what Paul's talking about. We knew from early on there's only one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We knew, we, you know, Jesus mentions it. So what is Paul talking about? Well, it's important to understand that he's using the term baptism in a very different way, but one that is used in the scriptures a lot. Um, but so let's look at that. When he says baptism, he is not referring to the actual sacrament of baptism, but he is describing what was called later, it wasn't called this yet in Paul's times, but we see the beginnings of it. Um, Paul is describing the group called the Order of Penitents. These were Christians, living Christians, who took upon themselves the sacrificial lifestyle um, to pray for others, both the living and the dead. And they would offer sacrifice, they would fast, they would do all these things. Um, that's what Paul's talking about. It is believed that they entered into that group 
by a water ritual washing. Not baptism, they're already baptized, but sort of to mark the beginning of their phase of doing this penance for other people, they would um, engage in a ritual bath and then they would begin this practice of doing penitential acts on behalf of the dead. Now, the language comes from John the Baptist and Jesus himself, right? John the Baptist's baptism did not save anyone. He tells us himself, why did he baptize people? For them to repent so that their sins could later be forgiven. So in the same way now, Christians of Paul's time are, are quote-unquote, taking on this second baptism, so to speak, in order to atone for and pray for people who are great sinners, especially those who have died and need their prayers. Jesus himself uses this kind of language. Uh, if you go to page 31, the very top, Jesus says, I have come to set the earth on fire, and how I wish it were already blazing. There is a baptism with which I must be baptized, and how great is my anguish until it is accomplished. Right? He's not talking about his actual baptism, because that's already happened with John long ago. He's nearing the end of his death. He's talking about his sacrifice and death. He calls a baptism. Then when he's asked by James and John, can they sit at the side, his right and left, he says to them, you do not know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I've baptized? They said to him, we can. Jesus said to them, the cup I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But they don't have any idea what they're asking for. So here, again, Jesus is using baptism to refer to, a, in his case, the ultimate sacrifice for human salvation. So now, in the church, people, using the model of Jesus and imitating Christ, are undergoing these acts of penance and prayer and almsgiving and charity and all these things in the hope that united to Jesus and united to one another by the same Holy Spirit, that their actions, their practices are going to help remit the sins. They're going to offer sacrifice on behalf of those who are dead. In other words, it's the same story as the Maccabees. In fact, most scholars think Paul was looking at that story when he wrote it because he says the same things. At the end of, the pra at the end of his statement, Paul says, um, how, does he how does he mention it here? He says, if the dead, he's all, why would you be baptized if they're not raised at all? Why would you do this? But if so, then it's holy. Well, that's exactly what the, the end of Maccabees said, if you go back and look for it. If they thought the dead would not rise again, this would be a meaningless act. But because they knew of the resurrection, this is a holy and pious act. So here we move a step further. Not only does Paul himself pray for the dead and ask others to do so in his first story we looked at, now he goes a step further and says there are people who a large part of their whole life of ministry is prayer for the dead. And so, and in each case, he recommends it, right? He doesn't say stop doing this weird action or you shouldn't be doing it. He basically alludes to the fact that this is a good thing, right? It's a good thing so they'll share fully in the, in the uh, resurrection that he's just been talking about. So... Although it's a weird passage because of the language Paul used, it's actually very simple in its understanding. This is basically the beginnings of what we will then become the, um, the offering of the Mass, right? Where we have the prayer intentions, which are usually for the dead, not always, but usually. Uh, in the same way, here you have people, the beginnings of the order of people who, who sacrifice and make sacrifice for, them, for the sake of others, the suffering souls. Um, so the order of penitence would later grow because the one were those who were there voluntarily. That's the people Paul's mentioning. You were there voluntarily to pray for others or to atone for others. Later, a second group would be added who were required to be there. Who were they? Those were the Christians already baptized who had fallen into some serious sin. Um, we don't realize how easy we have it, right? which is why we should be at confession a lot more regularly, because it is so 
easy, thanks to the Irish monks. Prior to the seven, eight hundreds, um, sins could generally only be forgiven by the bishop if they were mortal, and, and your um, absolution was not given, it was suspended until you completed the penance given. And the penances were not like today, say three or four Hail Marys or something. The penances were hard, and they would last years, and they were humiliating. Um, you would stand outside church before Mass, and as all the people came in, you weren't allowed to go in. You would ask them to pray for you, and you were required to say publicly what your sin was, what they're praying for. So talk about humbling, right? <laughs> I cheated on my spouse this many times. Please pray for me. So what happened, though, is that people became so terrified of committing these sins <laughs> because they'd have to have these huge penances that people started withholding baptism till almost the time of death. And so the Irish monks kind of intervened at that point and said, well, we have a way we do it within the monasteries and such that might help. And that's literally how it transformed what it was because the old way was, was too difficult. And there were certain people, for example, Constantine himself, Constantine, the quote, Christian emperor, he was never baptized till literally a week before his death. He was never actually Christian during his life for the most part. And why? Because he feared his emperor, he'd do a lot of shady stuff. And he wasn't gonna do penance publicly as the emperor, he'd be too humiliated. So um, that was what the order of penitence consisted of. But this one survived into modern times. Um, it was more popular probably 30 or 40 years ago, but you, you have these groups that, you know, there's books called the Purgatorian Manuals, there's um, Devotions to the Holy Souls, all those kind of ideas and things really come out of what Paul is, is talking about here that started very early on in the church, but was really just a continuation of what Judaism had done, but now just enlightened with more information from Christ about um, the specifics of it. Now, Paul's last one is more is, is a bigger one because this is probably it, it, when you think about um, purgatory. If you know where to look in Scripture, this is the one that most people point to. This one in the Maccabees, um, because Paul actually sets about to kind of describe uh, something that it happens in the actual process. This is on page um, thirty-two. The first thing to realize is Paul is coming from the, the Hebrew background of the fire of God, that fire is this image of God. God is the consuming fire. He's accompanied by a destroying fire. God always appears with fire, right? He's the burning bush. He's the conflagration on Mount Sinai that covered in darkness and fire, the uh, tongues of fire that come at Pentecost. Fire, and even Jesus in that last statement, how I come to bring fire to the earth, right? So fire is the symbol of God's passion, his, his character. That's why every afterlife place is described by fire. Now, hell we know, that's an easy one. We always think of that as being fire. Purgatory is clearly fire. Jesus has alluded to it, and Paul's going to speak about it now. But even heaven is fire, right? Heaven is the burnished brass the burning places, everything is on fire because it's God's love. In a sense, God's love is unchanging, but depending on your state of soul, you experience it totally differently. The glorified love God and can't love him enough, the pure, the, those undergoing purification love him so intently they can't wait to pass on and actually experience him again, and those in hell just hate him all the more because he still loves them and they hate him so much, which only makes them hate him more. So it's the same fire. So it's, it's important to realize this image that Paul is drawing from is both uh, Jewish in its background, but also specific to Jesus. And here's what Paul says. He is describing the process of our spiritual life and how it, quote, ends. He says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a ma wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. But each one must be careful of how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one that is there, 
namely Christ Jesus. So first Paul talks about sort of the beginnings of our spiritual life. Paul is an apostle, so like a builder, he, his evangelization, when someone accepts it, the foundation is laid. G, uh, Paul preaches Christ, the person accepts, the foundation is there, and there can only be one foundation, Paul says, Christ. However, at that point, Paul's part in the process, in, in a sense, is done. And now it becomes the person's job to construct on the foundation of Jesus their own life, which is viewed as a building and a temple of the Holy Spirit because it's a holy thing. You, as a Christian, carry the presence of God himself, truly God himself, in you. So that's sort of the background. So now he's saying, well, now you're building upon it. So now it's up to us. What did we use to, quote, build our temple to become holy? And he mentions these different things. He says, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, the work of each will come to light, for the day will disclose it. Notice the same phrase he used when he said, pray for Nisiphorus to find mercy on that day. Same one. So Paul's referring to the same event, back to Onesiphorus, or another proof that what he was talking about back then he says the day will disclose it it will be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each one's work if the work stands if it passes the test if it's fireproof then that person will receive a wage but if someone's work is burned up that one will suffer loss. The person will be saved, but only as through fire. Painful. And then he has a final one. Do you not know you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Right? That's the building. You're a temple. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For the temple of God, which you are, is holy. So, what is, Paul, what is Paul saying? So, we all have the foundation laid. Now, for most of us, we're not hearing it through evangelization anymore. We may be, but for a lot of us, if we grew up in a Catholic family, your family just brought you to the altar to be baptized, and you were baptized, and you begin your Catholic life. So, your foundation is laid at baptism. Now, as each one of us goes through our actual life, what are the kind of works or deeds we're using to build are they ones that are flammable and weak bad works the works of the flesh he talks about the the hay the i forget what he the um wood the hay or the straw it's the works of the flesh where paul calls them otherwise that you've committed or are you building up with good works meritorious things symbolized by these precious jewels and stones gold silver etc so Everything we do, Paul makes clear, and we already learned this at the last judgment, or at the particular judgment, but everything we do is brought into God's strict and perfect judgment. God will scrutinize and examine everything about our, quote, temple, our very, our very life. This occurs at the moment of death, and it will be revealed in the truth for what our life was really, no matter what we proclaimed it to be or pretended to be. It'll all be laid bare there of what we really are. And so the day, he says, will disclose it. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each work. So in that process of, quote, judgment, when you're experiencing this God's um, scrutiny of you, God's power, God's fire, will test the quality of your work. Every single one of us will experience the same spiritual fire without distinction, but what you come out on the other side of it is what will differ. Everyone passes through the same one. Everyone doesn't end at the same place. And Paul says there are three possibilities. The first possibility Paul refers to, those whose temple is only made of good materials, gold, silver, precious stones, good works. 
that person will receive a wage, he says. That is, they're rewarded. They receive the reward of paradise, the same as Jesus mentions in his parable of the, of the uh, stewards. The one who built with both good and bad materials and has them both present at the time of death, which is probably most of us, not that I'm going to assume anything about you guys, but probably most of us have good and bad. How will they, what will happen to them? Well, their, their evil deeds, their bad things will be burned up and that's the experience of purgatory. But ultimately, they will be saved. It won't be as peaceful a process as the ones who went right into heaven. They will, quote, suffer loss. It is going to be painful to have that part burned Chris, away. Yes? Is that a typo there, number two? One who built both good and materials? Oh, and bad. It should say with yeah. both good and bad materials. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, there should be a bad in, put in there. Um, but ultimately, their good works, their real character, their state of grace ultimately shows that they are, are saved as well, which is what we believe is, in, in a, which we teach about purgatory. And then after that process is over, they, are, they suffer the loss, but then they are saved, passing through the fire. But then there's the third group, which some people miss because they stop the passage early, but there's not. Some of us only built with bad materials so that there isn't really even a temple that's there. We have destroyed God's temple, uh, Paul says. We've destroyed ourselves by living a certain way, ending in a state of mortal sin, and so, quote, God will destroy that person, right? the eternal death of hell. So Paul does lay out the three things, and in this he's been pretty consistent with Jesus' statements um, and Jesus' teaching in the parables, and so you have this moment of, of the judgment. And here Paul is basically saying the same thing we've heard the whole time. That some who built with only good works immediately receive their reward. They go to paradise. Those who did only, for the most part, evil works or bad ones who have destroyed the temple, they experience destruction. But then there's this group that's the mixture. They have both good and bad, but predominantly good. That's who they really are. Um, they suffer loss, and they first pass through this fire but then ultimately they pass into paradise. There is no, Paul is very clear when he says they will be saved. In Greek, the definitive makes it clear that there's no, there's no other place for them. They're old, they are absolutely saved. Yes, they have to go through a period of this um, <coughs> purification, but they're saved. So really, just like we've heard in the other stories and such, it's the same idea. You have those who go immediately, those who are delayed for a time because of being perfected still, and then those who are outside entirely. So what we're starting to see through the scriptures is there is a pattern that keeps emerging of the same basic idea of what's occurring. Now, Paul mentions this idea of, of loss. Um, and what is he talking about with this loss? Well, for this, at this point, I want to sort of turn to the smaller one because it's easier to, to go through. It's just the highlights of what I spoke about in, um, in, the, uh, in the big handout. So everything here is in the big handout, but I just wanted you to have an easier reference for those who wanted to. Now let's move out of scripture to what the church teaches. Remember, this is still theology, but there's good reason to believe most of it is correct from the amount, how it accords with what the scriptures do say, what the church does teach, and the, the um, testimonies we've had of both the saints who have seen it, as well as those uh, purgatorial spirits that have returned. So what is life like in purgatory, right? in as much as we can grasp it? What is life like for those who are in purgatory? Well, the first thing to be absolutely sure of, and this the church does, is clear on. This is not just theology. This one is clear. Those in purgatory retain their self-identity. They know who they are. They know their lives. They have all their memories. 
They are complete. They don't exist in some kind of soul sleep. Um, like Jehovah's Witnesses say at death, you just actually die. And then God recreates you out of nothing at the end. The church rejects that. Some people say that you just are sort of in this state of unconsciousness until God resurrects you. Also not true. Church rejects that. So those of, our, those of our loved ones and friends and such who have passed beyond, they're themselves. They know who they are. In fact, in a sense, they know themselves better than ever before because being already near to glory, the saints the, or the holy souls in purgatory cannot be tempted anymore and they cannot sin. So there's no distractions for them. There's nothing to take them away from God. They're completely focused on the Lord. And because of this, because they're in this very deep spiritual state, they know Christ in a more direct manner than we do. And through their knowledge of him, they also experience, and, and on this, the saints are unanimous, uh, whether uh, Teresa of, of um, Avila, whether... Uh, Catherine of Genoa, they all say the same thing. The saints in purgatory, or those in purgatory are filled with an overwhelming charity, peace, joy, trust, security, and zeal. They are perfected in that sense already beyond us um, because they have seen Christ only for a split second at that moment of judgment, but that Sight itself was enough to let them know the truth of everything they've been held on to in faith. It lets them know with assurance that we in earth can only guess of their own salvation. They know they're saved. They're in the place of being saved. Um, and they know what Jesus is. And even that brief glimpse is enough to spur them on for as long as their particular purification lasts to, to get to see him again, to be able to finally reach him. So those in, in um, one of the strange paradoxes is they are in, per, in this great joy and peace and such. Now, the souls in purgatory interact with each other. Everyone's not just doing their own thing, right? It's a deeper communion than even here on earth. And so they're bound by the same charity for one another. They interact with one another. Um, they are aware of and connected in a special bond to those who pray for them on earth. So by a, a direct mystical knowledge, the souls in purgatory know who is praying for them and offering things on their behalf. And so a special bond is created that the souls in purgatory now uh, especially pray for those people on earth who are praying for them as well. So there's that special bond that's connected between those and those who pray for them. Now, we'll talk about the place and duration in a moment, but they, at least from what is said by the visions of the saints and the purgatorial spirits, they do perceive purgatory as a place, whether it is or not, or that's how it's experienced or how they try to describe it to us. It is a place. They can see boundaries, so to speak, and yet it extends as far sort of as the eye can see, but it does seem to have this idea. Now, when it comes to things on earth, they are not the same as the saints. When it comes to events on earth, those in purgatory know nothing except from their own family, who they're still connected to, what's happening in their immediate lives, from those who pray for them, and the only other information they get of what's happening on earth is when newly dead people arrive to tell them things. Otherwise, they do not know what's happening here in general. Um, unlike those in paradise who know everything that's going on. So, but they do have a, this heightened awareness. Now, while they cannot merit anything, they can and do call upon Christ constantly. They pray to the Blessed Mother. They pray to their guardian angels. Um, and they, are, they seek to pray for us to assist them in their purification as well. In certain circumstances... God, and that's where these encounters come from, in certain circumstances, God will allow one of these spirits to literally manifest, I guess, or appear or encounter a living person on earth. Usually, usually someone who is connected to them, but sometimes not because of circumstances. Um, 
it, off, it either occurs like a real apparition, like you hear of, of the Virgin Mother when she comes, or it will occur more often in a dream. A person will have a recurring dream of someone who's passed away out of the blue. Like there's nothing that necessarily brought the dream about, and they'll have this dream, and it's very vivid, and it might, may last a few times um, until the person finally sort of gets the idea that, that the purgatorial soul is asking for prayers. But that's kind of their life in as much as we can grasp it. Now the place and duration, as I said, the church has never defined if purgatory is a place, a state of existence, if it's a place exactly where it exists. Um, they've also never defined the time directly. But here's what most have said. This is the quote majority of our understanding from the saints and others. Um, Purgatory, at least as it is experienced by those who see it or are in it, does seem to be experienced spatially. In other words, the souls ex feel themselves of being in a location. Um, in some ideas, we talked about the near-death experiences and what people have when they are in these celestial landscapes. It's probably very similar, right? They're experiencing this, this kind of um, ex experience. Now, the church has never defined it, but what many of the, in fact, almost all of the people who have seen it in visions, the saints or uh, those who have been visited by one of these spirits, almost all of them had said this as well. Purgatory has different regions from the place for those who really need a lot <laughs> to the place that's really those who died with just a little venial sin and will soon pass into heaven very soon. Um, and that they're sort of, while they can all interact with each other, they seem to be in these different regions. Uh, the worst region is reserved for priests and religious who, did, who are still saved, but were bad in their vows and their responsibilities towards the flock. Um, in fact, that's the main people that when the saints see them, like uh, St. Faustina sees a saint, or a, not a, a priest experiencing his, so did St. Catherine of Genoa, um, that because of their role, who they're supposed to be, in a, in a real sense, they, to whom much is given, much is expected. So when they fail, it's bad. The church has also, through Padre Pio, um, Catherine of Genoa, um, uh, Teresa of Avila, Bonaventure, and others, has also have, in a sense, told us the sins that merit a, quote, long duration in purgatory. Now, first let's talk about purgatory in, in its understanding. Purgatory seems to exist within our own frame of time. Now the souls there don't experience it exactly the same way, but it seems to at least correspond or be connected to our own time uh, timeline. This comes up a lot of times where a soul will appear and they'll mention how long they've been suffering. And you know when they physically died, so you can kind of see how these things match up. Um, at one point, uh, one of the most famous purgatorial stories is the father of a nun in Belgium who had passed away and began to um, come to her. Now that story is famous because it's one of the longest extended periods. I think it lasted three or four months. And it was seen by over 13 different witnesses directly, the spirit, who also spoke to it, some of the other sisters and such. And so at one point, a sister asked him, one of the other sisters asked this other nun's father, um, is, my, is my younger sibling, what, you know, whatever her name is, in heaven yet? And he said, yes, she just crossed over very recently, like in the last week. Well, she'd been dead 24 years. So exactly how time works there, we don't know, but they are in time. Uh, one of the things we, this is a side thing, but it's important to realize, the saints and angels don't live in eternity. Nothing can exist in eternity except God. The saints and the angels live, here's a new word for your cocktail parties. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Okay. It means that they take in... They live in time, like us, but they don't, aren't changed by it. 
We're changed by time. The angels and saints aren't. But they still experience day by day by day by day. It just doesn't change their character. They're set. So in that sense, it's like eternity, because God is unchanging. On the other hand, they do experience a succession of time. And this is the actual technical term for it. Um, those of you who are like science nerds and stuff, you may realize that this sounds a lot like quantum physics, which is non-local. That is, the quantum realm doesn't have time as we have it. Things appear simultaneously in different places continuously and are connected. But the point being, they do experience some form of, of succession of days. In a sense, they have to because they're being purified of what they did here on earth in time. And so that's obviously a process that requires a beginning, you know, phases and an end. But exactly how that's experienced, we don't know. What the church does teach, though, is the time, however we understand it, is proportionate to the amount of cleansing that particular soul needs. So there's no just generic time period that everyone goes to. It's what does this person need? What does this person need? What does this person need? Now, what are the sins I mentioned that take a long time to be purified of? Um, oh, and just before I, I, there, I, I list them here, but just so it's clear, because someone asked me at the break at the Monday class. Remember, we're talking about people who have been forgiven, right? Because one of it is murderers. Well, we're not talking about just a murderer. You don't get to go to purgatory and get rid of murder, right? If you died as a murderer, you're in mortal sin. But if you have repented, that's what we're talking about. So just to make it clear, what are those sins? Then we'll take our break. Suicides, mm -hmm. right? Some suicides do merit hell still. To pretend they don't is wrong. There are some people who kill themselves deliberately, knowingly, with full knowledge, etc. But most probably don't. And therefore, it's not mortal sin, even though the action itself is, gra is grave. Mm -hmm. right? They don't have, a lot of times by definition, the full consent, the full, because usually the people do it because they're mentally and emotionally, they're completely unstable in some way or hurting. But because the act is still egregious, it's the taking of a life, their own life in this case, that merits a long time to, to experience this. Um, others would be things like murder, you know, which would include euthanasia, abortion, etc., because it's murder after having been confessed. Um, rape, blasphemy, sexual sins, and deathbed confessions. So the deathbed confessor doesn't get off light. They are saved. That's God's mercy. Padre Pio says they will be there until Judgment Day itself. In other words, they, they will be there a long time, right? They'll be doing cleanup crew after the beatific <laughs> vision or something. But necessarily all still saved. And the other thing which we'll talk about now, it's the break, we'll look into after the break. Remember, we can shorten that duration. You and I, by the prayers we offer, by the sacrifices we make, by all these things, we shorten that. So that also shows that it's hard to give any specific timing because they're already suffering along a, their own individual um, progression rooted in God, that God is bringing them along. But he also enables us to, out of charity and love, to help them move forward which, if you really think about it, is the greatest gift, right? There are a lot of things we can do for people on earth, but for those in purgatory, you're, ending the, you're, you're giving them the greatest gift. They'll, they actually can see the face of God that they've been created for that much quicker, right? The only thing equivalent here on earth is, you know, converting someone to the faith of salvation in the first place. But it, it really is a, a great gift. Um, we'll take our break. We'll talk, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about um, what is the pain that's experienced. Then we'll look at paradise, which we don't have to spend a lot of time on. And then uh, we'll just do a quick little blurb of what indulgences are. Okay, let's um, look at the, the pains that associate. What is this cleansing fire? Well, again, the church has never defined the exact nature of it, 
whatever it is, it, it's obviously something that can harm a spiritual or a spiritual being can experience. It's not an earthly fire. It's some kind of spiritual. But whether it's literal or whether it's a, um, you know, a, a symbol that they use. But many of the souls do sort of refer to this as well as those who, the saints who have seen purgatory. Um, again, we don't know the nature of it. But just as we have the odd occurrence that people who suffer near-death experiences feel themselves as kind of possessing a, a body, so to speak, in some sense, even though they can even see their body laying there on a, on a table or something, in the same way, the saints have some kind of still connection to the feeling of their body. While we don't know exactly how this is, um, some people have explained it, some theologians have said, well, it's probably analogous, not exactly, but it's analogous to people who have phantom pain, right? People who have an amputation, they can feel actual pain where there is nothing there anymore because the brain and everything are still attuned to that piece of the body still exists. And so in the same way, maybe the consciousness afterwards, so in other words, we don't know how to explain the fire, but there is some kind of real experience those souls go through. They're referred to as a pain, and there are two types that have, that have, um, if there's anything that in theology of purgatory that is pretty settled, this is one that's almost unanimous of anyone who's written about it from Augustine to modern times. Two types of pain. The pain of loss and the pain of sense. Now, we'll look at the pain of sense first. The pain of sense is the actual healing process of God. And to break down our wills, the, the experience of seeing the betrayals we did to God, our failures, the reason, knowing we're here for our own, because of our own fault, etc. That whole process is painful. Um, because as he's healing us, you know, he's, in a sense, it's spiritual surgery. However, those pains, the pains of sense, decrease the longer you're there, right? As you become more perfected, more purified, those pains diminish, diminish, diminish till they're gone. The other pain, however, is called the pain of loss. And that is, as I mentioned, at that last particular, at the particular judgment, the person sees Christ just for the briefest of moments. But in that one brief moment, seeing the glorified risen Lord um, impels them. It fills them with such a charity, a joy, etc., that they long for him in a way we can't even grasp. Right? Even as much as we might long to be with Jesus and desire to see him in some way on this earth or be certain of his you know, existence, the, those in purgatory have seen him. Now they know what they want, and they strive in every way possible with all of their might to reach him. And that pain, that longing, and even on an earthly level, the mystics talk about this. Paul talks about uh, Paul, uh, St. John of the Cross, if you've ever read some of his works. He calls them the darts of love, the fiery darts, that when you go into these mystical states, you're penetrated by this. It's painful because you, the love is so overwhelming, you can't even describe it. It becomes painful and flows out of your heart to your whole body experiencing it. And John of the Cross says when he would come out of his mystic, mystical experiences, he would cry for a long period of time. And, he, and a lot of the saints say, they know, in a sense, that they um, are, how do I put this? Are the, okay, um, the saints long to be with God so much that they look forward to their death. <laughs> because they know only at that point will the experience they've had for brief moments be unending. Now, we're not talking about people with a death wish, right? John of the Cross and, and Teresa of Avila don't go out looking for people to kill them. They're not going to commit suicide. That's a mental aberration. But it's this idea that having experienced it, they know they'll never feel anything like that on this earth again. And the desire to have that, that feeling over and over. So that gives us a little tiny taste. And those are people on earth, even the highest mystics. A little tiny taste of this. Unlike the other pain, however... This pain increases the longer you're in purgatory because you want it more and more. It just keeps building up, and it only ends at exactly that moment that you pass into paradise finally, and you get to see um, and be in the presence of Christ. 
So those are the two, quote, pains that occur. And purgatory has this paradox that is very difficult for us to understand. But it's this paradox of greater joy and peace than you and I will ever know on this earth, mm -hmm. at the same time mixed with a suffering that's more painful than any will ever know on this earth. And uh, uh, St. Uh, Catherine of Genoa says the two exist side by side. They do not diminish each other. So they exist hand in hand. John of the Cross says what's occurring is, is purgatory is our spiritual crucifixion. That because the whole Christian life is to be like Christ, to become Christ-like, God-like, then purgatory is that final moment of Jesus crucified where he's experiencing the absolute victory of God, yet at the same time he feels that great suffering and pain. And so the joy, as the Hebrew letters to the Hebrew says, the joy that lay before him, he suffered the cross, right? So it's the soul's final experience of death, in a sense, death right before resurrection, in the sense that they're going to enter into heaven. So that's how like, it's sort of explained by the theologians and such, is this is the experience you're having of Christ, him, Christ's own experience of being crucified on the cross. Great pain but also knowing that the victory of God is at hand. Um, because they, as we've talked about a lot, right? those in purgatory, they know they're saved. They're absolutely certain of their salvation. They know they're saved. They've seen the Lord. There's no anxiety on their part. There's no fear. None of, all that is gone. That doesn't exist anymore. All that is in their vision, there's no distractions, is the love of Christ and to attain him, um, and the love of others in that you're praying for all those with you, you're praying for those on earth. Just everything about those holy souls exudes charity. That's why we call them the, quote, holy souls, because they are holy already, although they're not complete. So um, the other thing that has to do with duration is why are these durations sometimes very long? And the idea is, and Augustine pointed this out a long time ago, um, the suffering is long because it's... God is showing us the seriousness of sin. The punishment for sin should always exceed the pleasure you got out of doing it. Or else, in a sense, you got off light, right? And so you need to experience the reality that this brief moment, or whatever it was, is going to is really cost you a lot more in re your relationship with God than you realize. Uh, as Franciscans, we say an oath every day. We, we, we pray an oath that was written by Francis himself. Um, and it, it was what he, uh, he would pray it every morning. And so I pray it twice a day in the morning with my morning prayers and in the evening. Uh, and it goes, um, now I'm going to forget it, even though I say it every single day, because I say it in the list of like other, san uh, other things that I say. But um, great things we have promised. Greater our promise to us. To the former things let us observe, to the latter let us aspire. And then, he, and then he mentions this. Brief is the pleasure, eternal the penalty. Slight the suffering, the glory is measureless. Many are called, few are chosen, but all have their requital. Boom. So that's the Franciscan oath. Yeah, if it sounds hardcore, it is, right? <laughs> The myth of Francis as being the, the joyous hippie guy who loved animals, that's people who don't ever read anything Francis actually wrote. He was about penance and such was his whole movement and joy connected with that. Um, anyway, so that's the process of, of purgatory. Now, what happens then in paradise, this place or heaven as we generally call it? Well, again, um, one thing we have that benefits us is the scriptures actually talk about paradise. Not a lot, but they talk about it more than we're described purgatory. So we have a little bit more in that sense that's directly the word of God that we can rely on consistently. That being said, again, we're dealing with a, an experience, a situation that surpasses our understanding at this point. But here's what we can kind of give you. Paradise or heaven is the place of the holy, perfected, righteous dead. The souls there are saints, capital S, 
And they experience, like those in purgatory, they do not experience any temptation, any sin, any torment. But instead, they live in this constant state of being permanently and continuously blessed by Christ, who is present to them all there. Christ is present. The Blessed uh, Virgin is present. The holy angels are present. And all the saints are immediately present to one another there. And the glory of God, which shines through Christ, is permanently sort of is permanently there, permeating everything. Paul tells us literally that the joys and things experienced there are completely indescribable. That is, they far surpass any idea of pleasure, happiness, or fulfillment on earth. Right? That's Paul's statement: "Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, what God has prepared for those who love Him." So whatever it is, it's going to so, so um, greatly magnify anything we've ever known that we can't even really begin to speculate. Um, those who are there are fully aware of everything that occurs in paradise immediately. They're sharing in the omniscience of God to some extent, not entirely, but to some extent. They are aware of everything that has happened on earth and everything that is happening currently. They are not aware of the future, though. As it comes into play, they're immediately aware of what's occurring. But they can have a good guess because they can view everything happening, so they see where things are, are heading. So they have this complete understanding of events on earth, of one another in heaven. They can tell the state of a person's soul simply by looking at them. Um, they, and they are able to understand the basic understanding of everything that God did in, the, in creation. Why is creation the way it is? They begin to see all that, that stuff play out on how they understand things. So they don't know the future in its specifics. They know the future in the general sense of the coming kingdom. They know the certainty of that. They know what's happening on earth to everyone, not just their own family. They know what's happening in paradise among themselves. Um, and again, just to make it clear, just like those in purgatory, the blessed dead are not asleep in the sense that they're not conscious or they're annihilated until God recreates them. They are fully aware, fully perfected as they were created to be. Um, the exact nature of their existence is not clear. And the, the place it comes from is a very odd, again, another weird teaching of Paul. But if you turn back just for a brief moment to your, uh, the big handout, Go to page 42. Here Paul is um, answering a question. It's not just us today who think this. The early church, there were questions about, well, what is the state of the dead? Because the question first arose in, in Paul's earliest letter, written in 51 AD, um, the first letter to the Thessalonians. Already you have some Christians that are nervous because some of their fellow Christians have already died. And they're afraid, well, if Christ comes and those people aren't alive physically, will they be resurrected? And so these kind of questions are not new to us. These are something from the beginning of the church's existence it was having to answer. So Paul sets forth to begin to answer. Later, when he gets to the Corinthian letters, he really, those are his most extensive teachings on um, death, the afterlife, resurrection, etc. Here he has a, a, an interesting uh, description. He's trying to let his, you and I, his readers, know that we have a body on this world that's a physical body. We will have a body in heaven that's like Jesus' body, perfectly a spiritual body. And so what do we have in the meantime? It's a very confusing the way he says it, so I'll break it down, but let, let's at least hear what he has to say. He says, we know that if our earthly dwelling, a tent, should be destroyed, we have a building from God, a dwelling not made with hands, eternal in heaven. For in this tent we groan, longing to be further clothed with our heavenly habitation. If indeed when we have taken it off, we shall not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are weighed down because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. 
Now the one who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us a spirit, the Spirit as our first installment. Now if you look back on the notes on page 3, it's the, the last full paragraph, or the next to last paragraph on page 3. Um, first, Paul tells about our earthly body. That's a, quote, tent. The literal term is tabernacle. As, as Catholics, I know when we hear the word tabernacle, we think about the golden boxes that hold the, the precious body of Christ. The word tabernacle, however, only means tent. That's what the word means, because the original Jewish tabernacle was a tent. So Paul says our earthly bodies are tabernacles, right? Even this earthly body, which will pass away and dissolve and everything else, even it is to be understood to be treated with dignity. Because just like the tabernacle in the Old Testament, New Testament tabernacles, Catholic tabernacles did not exist yet when Paul writes. But just as the Old Testament tabernacle, which was a, quote, tent, but held God's own presence in the ark, in the same way, yes, this earthly body is similar. It's, it's, it's weak, it's, it's corruptible, it's all these things, yet despite all that, it actually holds the Spirit of God in it, in the baptized Christian, right? It's this thing of dignity to be treated with respect. He says, but even more than that, once it's destroyed, one day it'll disappear. He says, we have a building, and notice he returns to that idea of building like he did in the purgatory one, a building from God, a dwelling not made with hands, right? God recreates us from the inside out, so to speak, to match our, our souls. And we have this new body. And he says it's eternal in heaven. Um, now, heaven here, he doesn't mean paradise. He means God. What he's saying is we don't receive that till the end. It's kind of kept in, not like we have. he has literally spiritual bodies lined up for us to go into, but the idea that, that that's a promise that God has made to us, but it'll only be fulfilled at the time of the resurrection. So what's in between? Well, then he has this weird language of clothed, naked, unclothed. What Paul is trying to get across in all these strange statements he's making is that the dead in paradise exist in some kind of embodied experience. In other words, they do not float around as conscious souls, just floating around. They experience themselves in ways that they can interact, they see, they hear. Now, it's not the glorified resurrected body yet. It's not our physical body, but it's some kind of experience. Again, we point to the near-death experiences of people who their physical body is there, and yet they, they experience themselves walking, feeling things, touching things, seeing things. So the life you live in paradise is a human life, right? In the sense that we need all, all of our senses and such. But the exact nature of it, we, don't, we can't comment on. We can say certain things about it, though. From everything we can see in Scripture, the writings of the saints, etc., the, the body in paradise possesses no physical limitations as we know them. They can interact with matter, but they can also pass right through it if the desire takes them. Think of Jesus too, right? He could pass through the doors and just appear on the locked doors. He didn't open them. He didn't walk through it. He just is there. In a similar sense, the, the saints have that ability as well. Um, they possess this perfect, perfectly accurate perception in every way. So they can see further than we can. They can hear. They can all the, And they have this mental understanding of things. As I mentioned, simply by looking at you at a glance, they know your spiritual state entirely. Um, and they know everything about the created world. They don't know everything about God yet that they can know because that'll await the kingdom of God. But they know everything about the created world, the mysteries of creation, why did God create it, that structure we talked about of all the heavens and everything. They know all of that is part of their knowledge now. They are immaculate. They're absolutely pure, and I put the terms in parentheses, seemingly impeccable. Impeccable means, immaculate means pure. Impeccable means unable to sin, not just sinless. You can't sin. Um, I only put it in parentheses to kind of highlight something, and that is this. Um, do we still have free will? Absolutely. 
but we can't not choose God once we see him. You just can't. Um, and part of our confusion is we don't, because we don't experience free will properly, that seems to us to kind of contradict free will, but it doesn't. It actually means we're more like God. Think of it. God is infinitely free. There is nothing more free than God. God can literally do anything. But will God do everything? No. God is never going to do anything evil, despite the fact he could do whatever he wants, because his character won't allow it. In the same way, the saints cannot choose against God because now their freedom is actually perfect, unlike ours. Ours is still in a flux. We don't know what's good, what's evil. We change back and forth. They know. However, how do they live out that relationship with God? In their own unique, perfect way that's not the same as ours. So even when God gives the saints things to do, that's their free will. He'll tell an angel, right? I want you to see this is done. The angel says, yes, sir. Goes down, does it in any way he wants, so long as he gets the result done. Okay? The saints, when they appear, Mary and others, they're simply told, this is what I want you to do. But the saints themselves still love out their freedom. They still love God from their own unique life, everything else. So in that sense, they are sinless because they really can't choose it anymore in the sense that having seen perfect love, perfect the perfection of God, you can't leave that behind. They know the will of God perfectly, and this is one I didn't know until literally just last year, and the church teaches, especially Thomas Aquinas, that they can leave paradise anytime they want and go anywhere in the universe, anywhere on earth, anywhere in purgatory, not hell though. However, because they would never do anything against God's explicit direction to them, they wouldn't do so unless they think that it's his will that they do so. So in other words, when you have the Virgin Mary come, when you have these saints arrive and give these manifestations, um, in a sense, they, they're acting on their own desires, but also they're acting within the larger desire of God. It's actually one of the questions of the Summa. Like I said, I never knew that my whole life, but... Uh, Thomas is like, yeah, the saints are absolutely free. They can do whatever they want. They're, as long as it doesn't contradict God, they can do whatever is, is part of that joy of living that way. Um, they live in hope. Now, the reason they still live in hope isn't because of their sake, but they still desire, just like those in purgatory desired God to bring them into his presence, those in heaven continue to pray for God to make the kingdom come, and they're also still praying for us, right? Because our story isn't complete yet. And so they still live in hope for that. Not in anxiety, they're not afraid, they're not worried, but they live still in hope, constantly praying, interceding, and acting to continue to bring forth the kingdom. And then at the second coming of Christ, when the resurrection takes place, the last judgment occurs, and the kingdom starts forever, uh, there is a, I don't know how, how it actually is experienced, but there is an order to the, how people are raised from the dead. With those who have been dead the longest and having lived this experience with God the longest being first, Paul tells us, and then met by the others little after little until the whole world is, um, is resurrected then. So again, paradise, in, in one sense, it's one of those things that we have it planted within us from the very beginning of our existence. We, we seek this thing. We can't give words to it. Right? Even people who are completely non-religious, they're always looking for something more. How do we explain that? Right? We're the only creature on earth that wants more. When an animal completes what it has to do, even the highest animals that we think of as highest, like dolphins and chimpanzees, when an animal completes a task, what does it do, anyone? It goes to sleep, right? If there's no predators, if it has food, if everything's taken care of, it just goes to sleep until it needs to wake up and then do it what it does again. The minute we complete anything, we're immediately going, okay, what's next? Now, why is that? It's because in us, God has, Augustine says it poetically, he's planted eternity, right? And so nothing else satisfies us. So 
on the one hand, any way we describe paradise now sounds great, but also a little like, eh, that'll be boring after a while, but it won't be. See, that's what we don't understand because God being infinite, we never fully reach everything he can be. For all of eternity, yes, we're with God and the others, but we're co constantly being drawn closer and closer into his love. Just when we think you can't experience love even more powerfully, boom, you're, it's even that greater. So although it's hard to put into words, it's hard to really grasp, somewhere in us we know it, and not just as Christians, everyone kind of has this longing. As Christians, now we can give a name to it and point towards it with a little more specificity. But at the same time, you know, there's no description I could give you that you'd be fully satisfied with and be like, oh yeah, you know, it's always going to be a little bit of this mystery until it's finally there. But, you know, when you look at the people who have experienced near death, when you read about saints who have had visions of it, uh, sometimes people as they're dying, if they're getting closer, sort of the veil gets a little thinner and they begin to experience bits of it. The one thing that's unanimous about all of them is it's so much better than here, right? I mean, how many near-death people revived are so angry that they're back on earth, mm -hmm. right? And they still love their loved ones and everything else, but they're like, why did you bring me back? Is usually one of the first things that people say. Why did you bring me back, you know? Um, in the doctor's defense, if God wanted you to stay there, there's no way they could bring you back. So blame God, but you're not ready yet, I guess. So anyway, <laughs> paradise. Let's, um, let me finish with, uh, so we have time for questions at the end. Let me finish real quick with indulgences. This is more of the practical of how now can you and I help the souls in purgatory. Um, this is a very basic understanding. But what is an indulgence? Remember, we talked about a sin causes all these effects. One of the effects is a spiritual one that um, is literally our relationship with God himself. That's the, quote, eternal punishment. That's the guilt. That's what's taken away of in confession. Or for venial sins, it's taken away of just when you actually really repent of it and ask God to forgive you. The temporal punishments, though, the effects of sin, the hardening of your heart, those things don't automatically necessarily go away. So an indulgence is one way, not the only way, but it's one way to deal with, be very clear here, already confessed sin. So these are sins you've already confessed and received pardon for. For yourself or for the dead. And it can remit or take away either all of that, those effects, that's called plenary, all of those effects, or it can take away a portion of them. We call that a partial indulgence. But four things to be very aware of. An indulgence cannot free a person from hell. Right? Indulgences are for the saved, those either struggling here on earth still in the process of grace, or those who have died in grace but still need to complete their purification. Two, a person, uh, and the reason I bring these up is these come up from Protestants a lot. Mm -hmm. um, a person cannot gain an indulgence for future sins. Now that should be obvious, but just in case, you can't go and collect all your indulgences up and then like in Monopoly, you land in jail, you go, I got a, a few here, right? Nope. No, it has to be already confessed. You can't build up your indulgences for that time you know I'm going to fail later. No, they're only for things that have already occurred. They cannot do anything opposed to something that's going to happen in the future. Number three, indulgences cannot forgive the guilt of sin, right? They do not replace the sacrament of confession to get rid of the guilt of your sin, nor can they even replace just your own real repentance said by yourself in your room or at the confidior in mass to, get, to forgive venial sins. It can't even achieve that. It has a very specific purpose. It only works on those wounds and that hard-heartedness that have arisen in you that still remain even after you've been forgiven because you've placed yourself sort of opposed to, to the will of God. And then the last one, and this is, this is one that you hear the most, indulgences cannot be bought, and they never were bought. They weren't even bought in the time of Luther. It's actually not one of Luther. He critiqued a lot of it, but he didn't ever say in the 99 Theses that they were selling indulgences. What would happen is, like today, there are different ways you can do an indulgence, and many of them were almsgiving, 
And so people would do that. But indulgences themselves cannot be bought. In fact, to do so is a serious sin under the laws of the church. Now, how do indulgences work? Well, very briefly, because you and I are all bound together in one body with one spirit, the communion of saints, we can affect one another in Christ by our relationship to each other as we're connected in Christ. And the bold here are things to remember, not just for indulgences, but for our faith in general as Catholics. God blesses others and, in the case of an indulgence, remits the punishment of others as a reward to other people who love him. In other words, you, in a good relationship with God, can ask God to bless this other person or help this person be atoned for more, and God will hear and answer you because of his love for you. You see it over and over in the Bible. Um, God says, I should punish Israel this bad, but I'm only going to do it this much because I loved David so much. So David, long dead even, the merits of David continue to sort of give power. Think of the story of the paralytic, so famous. Remember, they tear open the roof, they lower him down. Look at the story closely. All three say the exact same things. It says, when Jesus looked at their faith, plural, the four men who brought him, not the dude himself, he forgave the man's sins. So those are ideas of what we're talking about. As Catholics, we believe that through my relationship with God, I can ask God to bless other people, to help atone for their sins, to do these different things, including those who have died, and that God will respond. So the re indulgence is through the instrument of the church itself as the communion of saints, and in cooperation with God's grace, um, you and I can draw upon Christ's own merits and power. <coughs> we can draw upon those, excuse me, of the saints, as well as our own, but of those people who are truly holy. And we can ask that that power be applied to them or to oneself in a very specific manner. Now, how, are, how do you do an indulgence? Depending on the type, they are very different. Because one is extremely simple, so simple that after you hear it, you're probably going to be like, oh wow, I could be doing tons of indulgences every day. And you are correct. Mm -hmm. The other one's very difficult. Now, let's look at the partial one. That's the one that only gets rid of a portion of this, um, uh, of the, Um, of the penalty. It gets rid of some. There's no direct measure that we know exactly how much is some. It just does as God desires. Now, what do you need to gain a partial indulgence? One, you must be in a state of grace. No mortal sins. You can, be a, you can have venial sin. That's still a state of grace. And two, you do the indulgence act. Now, what is the indulgence act? Well, for partial indulgences, there we give the church gives us categories, not specific things. So it has four categories. So here's the whole book. It's not very big. It was trimmed down a lot after Vatican II. But in the beginning, you'll see grants first grant, the second grant, and it's just a one paragraph, and then all the other things are just scriptural passages that show you where it came from. So the four acts are these. Any act of prayer, charity, slash almsgiving, penance, like fasting, or explicit evangelization, actually sharing the faith with someone. Any act of those done in a state of grace consciously desiring it to be an indulgence. You have to have that conscious desire in doing it. That's an indulgence. That's it. You could do, and there is no limit to the number of partial indulgences a person may receive daily. So a lot of what you already do could be indulgence if you just simply now 
apply that way. So if you do a rosary, that can be an indulgence because that's a form of prayer. And you're in the state of grace, you would do it anyways, but in this case, you also make a specific intention for this person in purgatory or for yourself. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things you already do on a daily basis can be indulgenced if you want them to be, right? So that's why I said the real, the, people can really gain a lot of them a day. Now for the second type, the plenary, that's much more difficult. That has five additional things, well, four additional things. You obviously have to be in the state of grace, then you have to perform the indulgence act. Plenary indulgences also require that you have gone to communion, usually the day of, the day you do the act. And then you have to have received the sacrament of reconciliation. For that, you have a leeway of seven days prior to seven days after. So within that period of time of doing the act, you have to have received confession. You offer prayers for the Pope, which there are no specifics, but generally speaking, most just say a simple, single Our Father, Hail Mary and Glory Be, for the Pope's intentions suffice. And then the reason why plenary indulgences often don't, often don't fully, they don't fail, but what they do is they won't give you the full thing if not all the conditions are met. Then they just become a partial one. But it's the number five that makes them so difficult. Not only must you be in a state of grace, you must be free from the attachment of all sin, even venial things at the time. If not, that indulgence automatically becomes partial. So for those acts, you cannot just pick any prayer, any, any act of charity. For that, the church has specific prayers and actions, and that's what most of the book is about. These are all the prayers the ones that they accept. Uh, there's about a hundred of them, roughly. And that's it. So, for example, I do the rosary every day anyway. When I do it, I, can, I just say my rosary. I'm in a state of grace. I say the rosary, and I'm going to pray this particular rosary for my deceased um, father. Done. I can pray the rosary as a plenary indulgence, but now there's rules. It's not just a rosary, it's all 15 of the original set of mysteries. So I have to pray all of them, and it may have to be in a church. In other words, plenary ones have very specific actions. It's not just any action of prayer or almsgiving. They have to be very specific. So that's what, what differs between the two. Um, the one are kind of general, any action of prayer, fasting, almsgiving, or evangelization is fine. The second one is much more uh, difficult because it literally, I mean, if you achieve it, that sin, either your own, the effects of, that, of those sins in either your life or the person you're praying for, they are completely gone. So if you do that for the dead and it works and it's plenary, that person is in paradise now. It's occurred. So that's why there are such difficulties placed on them um, because it is such a, it, you're really making a sacrifice that God is rewarding when he sees all the things you've done and the extent to which you're willing to go to kind of give um, someone else this grace especially. Now I'll mention one particular one because there are a few that are kind of outliers. Sometimes there'll be a private revelation that promises basically the equivalent of a plenary indulgence or sometimes even something more than that. Um, the most recent one that comes to mind is divine mercy. Now, as Faustina writes it in the diary, if you, on the day of divine mercy, if you do the chaplet, if you venerate the image, uh, she says that God will forgive all of your sins, guilt and punishment. All the, that's way bigger than any indulgence. So, as Divine Mercy became part of the universal church's practice through John Paul II, the question began to arise very quickly, well, what, what are we saying as the church, what does actually happen on Divine Mercy Sunday? So here's what the church says. The church cannot guarantee any private revelation. Even ones that it approves of, it doesn't guarantee anything about it in the sense that it's absolutely certain. Because when the church approves anything private, whether it's an apparition of Mary, whether it's this divine mercy, 
whether it's the sacred heart things, the scapular, all it can say is this seems to be divine in its, in its um, thing, and there's nothing in it that in any way hurts the Catholic faith but we do not have the authority to say whether it's true or not. It's not part of divine revelation. So what the church says is we cannot guarantee that what Faustina says in her diary actually occurs. However, whether it occurs or not, we will as the church, because of the people who go to it with that in mind, we will place a plenary indulgence on the divine mercy that day if you do the things that she said you would normally do for you know, to receive that special grace. So divine mercy actually has two in a sense. It has the actual official plenary indulgence from the Pope, and then it has the private revelation that promises even more than that to those who, who experience it. So sometimes the church has to kind of um, weigh up on how they're going to do these kind of things. So, well, we've all basically almost reached the end guys you, you're the diehard you made it through the end uh, <laughs> but we do have just a few minutes um, questions and stuff that I can kind of respond to I yes. just have one question in, um, in the bible it says that X amount of people will be allowed to go to heaven oh right 144,000 those things yeah right. so no, um, that? yeah um, that goes back to what I mentioned before is that um, Hebrew um Every Hebrew letter has an associated number with it, just like Roman numerals and such. And so words and numbers are interchangeable in Hebrew, and it's the way they, it's, it's very complex the way that Hebrew is written. But the point being, there are certain numbers that repeat themselves over and over because they're symbolic of a truth. So we see 10, and we see 40, and we see 1,000, and we see 12, and we see these numbers, 7. Um, in the case of, of that what you do what they've done is they've taken several um sacred numbers and added them together to make a spiritual point so you have 12 which stands for the old testament right the 12 tribes and you multiply that by a thousand so that's twelve thousand, in order to um or i should say this let's say this so you do 12, then you multiply that by 12 for the New Testament, led by the 12 apostles. So now you have 144. And then you multiply that by 1,000, because 1,000 in, in um, Hebrew conception is symbolic of like an uncountable number. Uh, it, it, it's like it, they use it, they had a real number 1,000 to use, but they would use it in the way that we use things like words like gajillions, right? It, doesn't, it, it sort of doesn't really make any sense. The point in that story being that the 144,000 is not a literal number, but it's the uncountable number of those of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant combined into one group, the whole totality of who God has saved, Jew and Gentile, uh, together. Um, but that's why a thousand comes up a lot. Like supposedly some evangelicals think that Jesus will reign for a thousand literal years on earth because it says a thousand in, in the Bible. And, um, but it's important to realize we're talking about uh, symbolic numbers of what's that are, are pointing to something else. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else you guys? No, no. All right. Uh, I, hope I, I hope you got some stuff out of it. I'll tell you one thing for me. I've always believed in purgatory. I've never had any problem with it. I understood it. I think it makes sense. But in doing the actual, all the research and such, it really motivated me to start praying for my deceased dad, my, my father-in-law. I, I have two siblings who have passed away. So I've made it more of a part of my own life, just reading about it more and, and studying it, that it's become a more um, active part of my life. But so um, uh, there's nothing next week. There'll be a new class starting soon. It'll be in the bulletin. I'm just going to do a short three-week class on the virtues is what I've decided, how to live a, a, quote, virtuous life, faith, hope, charity, and how that emerges. Because what I'm going to do in October is leading up to the um, uh, All Saints Day and All Souls Days, I'm going to spend in October, I'll just do like a three or four-week one as well, 
Um, and a lot of the stories that I was not able to share in this class, I'll go over in those since we're approaching Halloween and All Saints Days. We'll do a story of, you know, one of the, I'll actually go over these stories of the saints who come in purgatory who have seen heaven or the apparitions of Mary as we get closer. So it'll kind of be with the season in a, in a sense. And people who want to hear some of those more personal things and the experiences people have had. So that's what's coming sort of down the pike. Let's go ahead though and end in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Almighty and ever living God, we appear before you, Lord, and just as we stand before your awesome might and majesty, we thank you for the gift of having created us out of your love, Lord. We thank you even further for having sent your own son to offer himself on our behalf and to redeem us, Lord. And we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who dwells within each one of us and continuously conforms us to the image of Jesus, making us more and more a temple of your spirit and of your love. We ask, Lord, that our life would be changed by the understanding of our afterlife, of knowing what's coming, of what is to be expected, of how we are to live. Help us, Lord, to begin to live an authentic Catholic life here and now. Help us learn that when we need, we have done wrong, that we repent of it, that we confess it, whether venially or if necessary in the sacrament of reconciliation, and that we begin to just live a life of more self-discipline in order to bring about our own salvation even more perfectly and clearly. And also, Lord, in our hearts, touch us for the prayers of those around us, both for those who have died, who we offer prayers for and, and ask in your mercy to hasten them along in their purification, but also those of the living here on earth that we just continually, by our example and by our prayers, hope to draw ever closer into relationship with you, Lord. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Lord, Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, you guys, have a good one, and I will hopefully see you in a few weeks when we start up stuff again. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. By the way, this is available for free online if people just look up. Just if you type in Google Handbook of Indulgences, it comes up. You don't have to print it out like I did. You can just look at it. But if you want to see like, what the actual prayers are for the plenary ones and stuff, they're all listed in here. So.